Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we continue with part 10 of Dr. R. Swinburne Clymer's Ancient Mystic Oriental Masonry. The Underlying Principle 114 The ancient wisdom religion is the thread soul on which are strung all the various incarnations and encasements of the religious life adapted to the changing conditions and developments of humanity in its growth from childhood to manhood. 115. Begotten by spiritual hierarchy, the Great White Brotherhood, in whose guardianship is the evolution of the human race, brought forth from them, they, the guardians of the mystic tradition, give to those children of men who are strong enough for the burden a portion of the real teaching of the divine science, the science of the soul, concerning God and man, and the wonderful relationship that exists between the two. 116. With the passing of time, the old orders changed, old forms perished, and the divine sun that shone on the ever-changing screen of time veiled itself in new hues and gathered into new groupings the humanity of the western races and each century which rolled by evolved a new phase of the ancient mystic tradition known as the great white brotherhood and in ancient mystic oriental masonry as the 11th degree students of the supreme initiation will see the beautiful philosophy of initiation by the Count M. D. St. Vincent. 117. Religious parties, secret societies, sects of every description, such is the shifting panorama of the religious life of the world during the last 1800 years. And as we glance back from our present standpoint, it is difficult at times to discern the mystic traditions unless one has the key. So loud is the clamor of contending sects over their formal doctrines, the outward expressions of their inner faith. 118. A word may here be said to guard against one error that might arise with regards to the spiritual hierarchy before mentioned. The guardians of the religious world, it is from this great communion that the world's saviors have from time to time come forth and from this center have sprung all the sons of God. For there have been many sons of God, not but one, as some seem to believe. 119. The building of form, even religious form, is materializing in its tendency. And thus we see that in all the centuries subsequent of the inception of Christianity, the tendency of every reformation has been to throw back if possible, to the original standard erected by the founder. 120. On careful investigation, for instance, we find the Christ responsible only for certain high and pure ideals, insistence being made on a holy life leading to a divine goal. The doctrine and elaborations which were later introduced arose in every case from the followers who brought in their more worldly aims and transformed thereby the purity and simplicity of the early ideal into an ornate body with worldly passions and constant strivings for mundane power. 121. Hence we find at the end of the 19th century on one side the Catholic Church on the other, the protestant, and between the extremes of these doctrinal communities, a fluctuating, ever-increasing body of thinkers, formed by the mystics and idealists of both parties, who from century to century have been at variance with their orthodox brethren, seeking a higher truth, a pure ideal, than those offered by the dogmatist. 122. The doctrines hidden in the secret fraternities, no matter what the name, 
have been handed down in regular succession from first to last. We can see that these esoteric teachings, which in Atlantis first, then in Egypt, in Persia, and in Greece, were kept from the ears of an illiterate multitude, precisely because it was known that they could not, in their then uneducated and ignorant condition, understand the deeper truth of nature and of God. Hence the secrecy with which these pearls of great price were guarded and handed down on with slight modifications into the possessions of those grand early Christians, the Gnostics, the so-called heretics, then straight from the Gnostic schools of Syria and Egypt to their successors, the Manichaeans, and from these through the Polychians, Abigenses, and Templars to the Hermetics, the Rosicrucians, and other less powerful secret fraternities. These occult traditions, or rather occult truths, have been bequeathed to the mystic bodies of their own times. Persecuted by Protestants on one side and by Catholics on the other, the history of mysticism outside of the Rosicrucian fraternity is a history of martyrdom. 123. These principal streams of religious thought can be traced distinctly as we struggle through a labyrinth of evidence. And these may not inappropriately be termed the Patriot, Pauline, and Johannine doctrines, the last being the fountainhead of all the later Christian mystical heresies. The Johannine doctrine caused great excitement in the 14th century. It must be borne in mind that the true occultism, the real mysticism, is essentially religious in its nature, and students must not be surprised to find that some of the historical religious sects, many of the principal secret societies that take St. John as their patron saint, notably is this the case with many of the Masonic bodies, had their foundation in occultism and mysticism before started. The occult doctrines of the Gnostics were heirlooms and sacred traditions from a very distant past, and when the early Christian era dawned, the human race had long been plunged in the darkening and materializing tendencies of the Black Ages. Soon the Gnostics was rejected by the Orthodox Church and the sacred and secret teachings of the great master, Jesus, became materialized. They have, however, never been lost, and traces of them can be discerned from epic to epic. 124. The Masonic movement, to state it generally, was at first a sort of broad, semi-mystic and largely moral movement, worked from certain unknown to them centers and deriving its origin from the ancient and not generally known basis. 125. It never had anything to do with operative masonry or the Builders Guild. Masonry was founded on the ancient wisdom religion and when founded was not known as masonry. 126. Its basis was and is unknown to all of those who do not recognize a definitely spiritual guidance in the practical, mental, and moral developments which, from time to time, change the surface by the introduction of new factors into the evolving processes of which life consists. Researches into Masonic literature must be made in many languages and countries before this view can be firmly established for the general world, but to the students of mysticism and who are also students of masonry, it becomes more and more apparent that the movement which is generally termed Masonic had its roots in that true mysticism, which originated as an ideal effort from the spiritual hierarchy which guides the evolution of the world, and that, however much the branches may be separated, from the root idea, there is nevertheless a mystic teaching in masonry for those who will seek below the surface. 127. 
the ancients of Atlantis preserved not less than 16 distinct secret orders, all of which constituted what was known at the time of the advent of Poseidon to the kingdom of Atlantis as the Mystic Brother or the Great White Circle. What is now the fraternity of the Rosy Cross was recognized as the very highest of these orders by virtue of their knowledge of the secret forces throughout nature. This order of men ruled by the destiny of nations and all institutions. 128. With the destruction of Atlantis, this perfection of order and organization was severed and history from this event only conveys scattering glimpses of these various orders, all of which, while preserving some remote impressions of their former relationships, have lost trace one of the other. 129 says John A. Wise, M.D., in his Obelisk and Freemasonry, According to our reading of history, the priesthoods of Bolas or Baal in Assyria, of Osiris in Egypt, of Jehovah in Palestine, of Jupiter in Greece and Rome, of Ohura Mazda in Persia, or Brahma in India, and of Tutates in Britain were primitive secret societies and instructed and governed the primitive families and races. It little matters whether we call the members of these priesthoods Belites, Pastafori, Levites, Curtis, Mage, Brahmins, or Druids. They were all connected by secret ties and intercommunicated from the Indus to the Tiber, from the Nile to the Thames, Hence, there ever has been, is, and ever will be Freemasonry on our planet. Masonry was ever more or less connected with priesthoods till about the 13th century of our era when Masons declared themselves by Marar, or Freemasons. Since about that period, priesthoods have ever denounced and persecuted Freemasonry. 130. A thoughtful consideration of our principal ceremony irresistibly leads us to the doctrine that was typified by the pastals in the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid and connects with the main characteristic of all the mysteries which embody the highest truths then known to the illumined ones. 131, the 12th century witnessed an outbreak of mystic symbolism, perhaps unparalleled in our error and gave us the religious legends of the Holy Grail which point to an Eastern origin. This period coincides with the greatest popularity of the Templars, whose fall is contemporaneous with the decadence noticed by the lecturer. 132. Without pressing the argument, I may suggest that some portion, at least, of our symbolism may have come through a Templar source. Romantist, yet deeply tangled with Gnosticism. While at a later date, the Lollards, inheritors of Manichaeism, and who were but one of the many religio-political societies with which Europe was honeycombed, possibly introduced or revived some of these teachings, one thing is certain, that satisfactory renderings of our symbols can only be obtained by a study of Eastern mysticism. Kabbalistic, Hermetic, and Pythagorean and Gnostic. 133. Down the centuries, we find enrolled the names of philosophic teachers who veiled their doctrines and figures similar to those in vogue among the Rosicrucians, and still more recent students, and often identical with the signs we blazon on the walls of our lodges and chapters. 134. About the year 200 AD, the most noteworthy Gnostic sect was a Persian branch, the Manichaeans. It was divided into three classes, auditors, elect, and perfect, and the sect was ruled by 12 apostles, with a 13th as president. Manichaeism was always a source of trouble to the church. St. Augustine 
between the years 374 and 383 AD was an auditor, but for some reason could not obtain advancement and so abandoned the system. The right had a theosophical gospel which taught that the basis of all religion was one. Says a student under the 11th degree, the alchemist and adepts veil the writings in such a hidden way that it's hard to read between the lines. It is said that Mercury is the mystery of magic and that Mercury is the story of Christ. It is also the first principle of all metals. And he who can attract things out of the mysterium magnum acacia is a true alchemist. Also that this power is possessed only by those who are spiritually developed. It is a miraculous thing to me that the Christ of orthodoxy, the crucified redeemer, etc. is according to science something so different as I have been taught. Note, this writer is a Gnostic initiate. The Acacia is the Hindu veil for Mercury. I think of Prana and Acacia, Sol and Luna, Sat and Tat, Solar and Lunar, principles ever working together as one. Then, my thoughts are centered on my heart, where, according to Gnostic teachings, the Christ of the Mysteries dwells in the secret chamber of the heart, Cardifurious Ether. Then again, I think of alchemy and the sages and wonder about Hermes calling Azot Nitrogen, the virgin of the world, Mercury the soul of the world. It is said, fire purifies the dross. Agni is the mediator, call him Mercury or Christ. And one must seek this Christ within, which is called a mystic fire. The heart is called the seat of life, where the sixth ether, Cardiferous, the Christ of the mystics, dwells. The sixth tata is soul knowledge. In 657, they had changed their name to Polycanus, and later Cathar, or the Purified. Eukites, Bogomils, and in more recent times, still Law Lords. We could quote numberless authors of the early period of the church to prove the origin of these sects from the Eastern Magi, but it is unnecessary and space forbids. In a few words, they were a secret speculative society with degrees, distinguished by signs, tokens, and words, like Freemasonry. And the Church of Rome, from the 4th to the 19th century, has hated them with the hatred of death, butchering and burning them by tens of thousands. For Christianity has shed more blood than any other faith, yet the fathers often admit their purity of life. But that was their sin against a corrupt priesthood and unpardonable. The Templars were Gnostics on the evidence of the papal trials in 1313, and Hugh GM 1118, is said to have received initiation from Theocritus, Patriarch of St. John the Baptist and the Codex Nazarenus. 135. The days of Constantine were the last turning point in history, the period of the supreme struggle that ended in the Western world throttling the old religion in favor of the new ones built on their bodies. From thence the vista into the far distant past, beyond the deluge and the Garden of Eden, began the forcibly and relentlessly closing by every fair and unfair means against the indiscreet gaze of posterity. Every issue was blocked up, every record that hands could be laid upon, destroyed. 136. This same Constantine who, with his soldiers, environed the bishops at the First Council of Nicaea, A.D. 325, and dictated terms to their deliberations, applied for initiation into the mysteries, and was told by the officiating priest that no purgation could free him from the crime of putting his wife to death, or from his many perjuries and murders. Every careful and unbiased student of history 
knows why the secret doctrine has been heard of so little since the days of Constantine. An exoteric religion and belief in a personal god blotted it out for self-protection. And yet, oh, irony of history, the very Pentateuch conceals it, and for many a student of the Kabbalah of the coming century, the seals will be broken. 137 Three centuries had passed since the origin of Christianity, when at this epoch of barbarianism, there arose in the same Persia, when so many teachings had gone forth, a philosopher who wished to lead back the confused spirit of men to the cult of the only true God. He was called Manes. Some of the uninstructed have regarded him as the first originator of our Masonic order and the creator of our doctrines. 138. Manes lived under the Persian king Sopers. He endeavored to recall to life in their entire purity the mysteries and the religion of Zoroaster, uniting them with the pure compassionate teachings of Jesus Christ. The teachings of Manes were liberal, whereas superstition and despotism governed Europe. It is easy to believe that those who professed demagogic principles and a religion free from all that was chimerical would be persecuted. Thus, the Manichaeans from about the 4th century were persecuted to the fullest by all the despots and by the Romish priest. The Holy Augustine, brought up in the mysteries of Zoroaster to a certain point, adapted to the holy teachings of Jesus, became his bitterest persecutor and the greatest enemy to the teaching of Manes, which was known under the name of the religion of the child of the widow. 139. This hatred shown towards Manes by St. Augustine and his zeal to the Christian Trinity doctrine, after he had been refused admittance to the higher degrees of the mysteries, arose in the vexation which Augustine experienced at having been only admitted into the first degree of the mysteries of Manes. The Magi, who had recognized in him an ambitious and restless spirit, were thereby induced to refuse to him all advancement, and this in spite of his nine years study, which he made in order to be raised to the higher degree. This fact is sufficiently confirmed by Fleury, Baroness, and by Augustine himself in his confessions. After the death of Manes, twelve of his pupils went forth into all parts of the earth and imparted his teachings and his mysteries to all people. They illumined, as with a lightning flash, Asia, Africa, and Europe. As may be seen from Baroness, Fleury, Bell, and others. 140. Already in the lifetime of Manes, his pupil Hermin had spread his teaching in Egypt, where Coptic priests and other Christians mingled it with the mysteries adopted from the Jews. It was through these same Coptic priests and the Eastern Christians that both the mysteries of the children of the widow and the cult of the great architect came to us in the consequence of apparently unforeseen events. And it will be seen that it was principally by the means of the Crusades that they obtained a secure footing in the West. The mysteries maintained their existence under the name of the cult of the great architect of the universe, G-A-O-T-U, a name that has its origin in the allegory of Hiram, which represented in the mysteries the unknown God, the eternal and sole creator of all things and the regenerator of all beings. 141. Bossuet, in his historic Des Variations, 4, says that in the Middle Ages, the Christian sects, and especially the Manichaeans and Gnostics, had concealed themselves as much as possible in the Orthodox Church itself. The reminder of the Manichaeans, who had maintained themselves only too well in the East, crowded into the Latin Church. Mount Falcon, 7. Page 271 says, 
when he speaks of the religion of the Egyptians, that the heresy of the good and evil principles, which had been upheld by the Manichaeans at various times, brought forth in the church great disorder. And he asserts that in the East, these doctrines existed at the time of the Crusades. The long time that elapsed during the wars of the Crusaders gave them the opportunity of being admitted into the mysteries of the children of the widow, the teachings of the great architect of the world, and of both principles. The Crusaders who had been admitted to the mysteries of the children of the widow and initiated therein imparted them on their return home to their pupils in Europe. During the sojourn of the Crusaders with the Muslims, all kinds of theological investigations were instituted. These led the Crusaders deeper into the faith in the great architect of the world, G-A-O-T-W. 142. In spite of the religious changes that followed upon the conquest of the Saracens in Asia and Europe, in spite of the persecutions introduced by them, the doctrines as to the unity of God was able to maintain itself by the means of the mysteries in Palestine, Syria, and Egypt, more especially, however, in the neighborhood of Thebes. For here the Christian and Coptic priests preserved, in the lap of their solitude, the teachings communicated to them by Hermann, the pupil of Manes, a teaching which later passed over into Europe. 143. It is proved that the Empire Randolph I, even in the year 1275, authorized an order of Masons, while Pope Nicholas III in the year 1278 granted to the Brotherhood of Stone Masons at Strasbourg a letter of indulgence, which was renewed by all his successors down to Benedict XII. In 1340, the oldest order of German Masons arises in the year 1397. Next follow the so-called Vienna Witness of 1412, 1430, and 1435. Then the Strasbourg Order of Lodges, 1495. That of Torgan of 1462. And finally, 16 different orders on to 1500. And to the following centuries, for Spires, Rockensburg, Saxon Altenburg, Strasbourg, Vienna, and the Tyrol. 144. At this period, the Roman Church appears to have made various futile efforts to retain a hold upon these masons, but without tangible results. For the forces at the back of these movements prevented the destruction of a new free spiritual growth at the back by the Roman power. At this period also came those great souls, burning for freedom, who worked the Reformation, such as John Totter, the famous Dominican, who formed a mystical fraternity, the members of which recognized each other by secret signs. Then we have Nicholas of Ball with his four disciples, that beginning of his friends of God. These men kept watch on all that was going on in the world, and they had special messengers who had secret signs by which they recognized each other. Nicholas was buried as a heretic. Although these reforms were dwarfed of their full growth by the natural crudity and narrowness of the human mind, Nevertheless, the dogmatic and mind-killing power of Rome was materially thwarted, and the spirit in the teachings of the Master Christ sat free from those trammels. Rites of Bath 145. Equally important in the formation of Freemasonry were certain religious communities and brotherhoods of the Middle Ages, which for the most part aimed at a return to the pure teachings of Christ and at making its ethical form familiar to those adherents. One of these brotherhoods was that of the Waldenses, established by Peter Waldo in the year 1170 at Lyons. Their aim was the reinstitution of the original purity of the church through the adoption of voluntary poverty. 
and the other ascetic practices. But because of the doctrine of transubstantiation, they soon came into conflict with the Catholic Church. And as early as 1134, Pope Lucius III excommunicated them, and Sectus IV in 1477 proclaimed a crusade against them. In spite of these attacks, they have kept alive up to the present day, and have spread into several countries, namely into Italy, France, and Bohemia. And in this latter country, we shall meet them again under the name Bohemia Brothers. 146. A few words may be summarized from the same writer about some of the other mystic bodies in Bohemia and Hungary. Lands full of occult tendencies. Among them are the following. Brothers of the Circle and Hammer. The Brotherhood of the Hatchet. The Friends of the Cross. This last society spread into the Netherlands and had its greatest success in the latter part of the 17th century. The Brothers of the Cross were still holding their meetings in 1785. They had many members in Wallachia and still more in Transylvania. Barbie, in his Masonic studies, says, it consisted principally of older men and those who were generally reputed wise and therefore of the prominent leaders of the Brotherhood who here, in the metropolis of the kingdom, formed a kind of stronghold on the inner east. 147, the last expression, which was in italics, is worthy of our notice, for it shows how the minds of men were turning, even in Masonic circles, to the eastern teachings. Abath also says that a great and molding force was exercised at this period on the form of Freemasonry by Jan Amos Kominsky, who was born at Bern in Bohemia in 1592, and who became chaplain of the Bohemian Brothers in 1618. When the civil wars began, Kominsky lost wife, child, and property, and was exiled from Austria, like all other non-Catholics. He escaped to Poland, turned his thoughts to educational matters, and became famous in Sweden, Hungary, and England. 148. Kominsky was actively interested in the Rosicrucian movement and joined John Valentinus Andrea, the reformer of the Rosicrucian fraternity, in his work in that body. In 1650, Kominsky was invited to Hungary and Transylvania by the Prince Ragozi, where he stayed four years. It is doubtless partly owing to his influence that the Rosicrucian movement spread so widely in these countries. His philosophical and metaphysical views were so widely spread that when Anderson wrote his book on Freemasonry, he, according to Abath, incorporated in his work a compilation of the most essential portions of the plans of Kominsky. 149. Says Abath, it was reserved for the Austrian, a Moravian schoolmaster, the chaplain of the Bohemian Brothers, to bestow ethical treasures upon a brotherhood in proud Albion, the home of the boldest intellects, to formulate the ideas and to point out the way for a league, which, after its transformation, was destined to embrace the noblest of all nations, and being brought to perfection by them, ordained to influence the whole of humanity. 149 and a half, the spread of mysticism in Austria and Hungary during the last century was astoundingly rapid. According to von Andri, about 5% of the entire population belonged to the Freemasons, Rosicrucians, and other allied societies. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating a little to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you very much.